Hi, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you, thank you, Gwen, for those um, optimistic uh, thoughts to get us uh, to get us started. Um, I am going to um, take a slightly different approach, actually. Um, and so I am. Um, I think I think yesterday we heard, um, you know, some great presentations and, and and discussion about the distribution of print book collections and um, and approaches to sharing those and. Um, our, I think I think I want to start by just reminding everyone that our greatest precedent for thinking about about books going forward um, is is our very successful experience to date in managing down library collections of print journals, and it's that kind of point of departure that for me is um, is interesting and, and I think important for uh, for us today. We all recognize that books and journals have different kinds of affordances. And, um, and I was asked to be here today to focus on some of those differences um, and thereby to add some complexity to our thinking about how to handle, how to handle books. Um, let, me, let me begin my efforts to, to, uh, to add some complexity with, um, with, well, with a gross oversimplification, um, which is really designed to illustrate why the differences, um, uh, the, the differences between books and journals actually matter to, uh, to our deliberations. Um, I'll suggest that there's two rationales for why we might pursue shared print for, for any type of collections, and th that's the simplification, is that there's only two. Um, the first rationale is that usage, um, usage is moving from the codex and other printed forms to digital formats. That's the sort of format transition argument that, that many of us have been interested in. But a different rationale, and one that I think we've, we've heard clearly in the presentations yesterday, and Gwen, even in your remarks just now, um, is that libraries have to reclaim um, space, that there's, there, there are needs to reclaim, whether it's off-site space or on-site space, um, devoted to collections um, for higher value purposes. And that's what I would characterize as a rationale around library transformation. And I think that we have, um, for journals, we've had the, the, um, the good fortune um, that we didn't have to choose from between those two objectives, the format transition and the library transformation. Since they were, for most use cases and for, for many libraries, um, they were equally true. Because usage has moved overall so completely from print to electronic formats for journals, um, the delivery issues are at most secondary for shared print initiatives for journals. And I think that's a really, really um, important thing for us to bear in mind. We talk about about you know having delivery and we and and you know making sure that we don't have dark archives, but delivery doesn't matter that much. Not to say it doesn't matter at all, but it doesn't matter that much for thinking about shared print to journals. Um, and you know, as um, as Scott explained yesterday, um, our shared offsite facilities are even beginning to manage down print journal collections. And so you know, we're reaching a point where it's not just the li the primary libraries, but even even the shared collections that are being managed down. And, and you know, that's why the, um, that, that, that notion that usage doesn't, doesn't really matter for print journals, that usage isn't a, character, a factor for print journals anymore once digital and digitized versions are available. Um, that was why um, our work at Ithaca SNR nearly, nearly a decade ago now to determine minimal numbers, uh, maybe not a decade ago, six or eight years ago, to determine minimal numbers of copies required to be retained system-wide, which some of you know is what to withdraw, but actually was really meant to ensure that everything is retained, um, at least in, in, in enough copies, seemed so important because journals in print format are overwhelmingly disused. And I'll, I'll, I, won't be, I won't beat that any further, but I think that that's what made it possible to think system-wide about how many copies do we need for preservation purposes because we had no reason to anticipate um, real amounts of usage. So, um, and we could see, see that pretty clearly. Um, that, that dynamic of disuse of the retained print collections um, has driven all of the types of issues that we were talking about yesterday. The benefits of, that, of, 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 of a shared approach, um, the selection process, scaling dynamics, and of course, costs. And, and that, I think, that I, I think we, we all may understand that, but I think it's worth pausing to reflect on, on that and what that means. And, and in particular, what does that mean for books which are so different from journals? So, um, so to, I, I can speak probably most clearly about those questions regarding books by taking a couple of minutes just to walk us through journals by, by contrast because, um, because attitudinally, I, I can show you attitudinally what our print to electronic transition looks like or has looked like for journals. Um, and I think that's, that's where, what, I'm, what I'm gonna do for a minute or two now. So, um, right, so, um, 
Is this coming up? Yeah, so for journals, um, I, I'm just gonna, gonna walk you through some slides. Many of you have seen these slides in one place or another before, but I think, it's, I think it might be worth reviewing. So these are faculty members. These are, these are uh, faculty survey from our uh, Ithaca SNR's US faculty survey series, and where I share library uh, director findings, it's from our, our library director survey series. So um, for, of faculty members, we gave a strongly worded statement. If my library canceled the current issues of a print version of a journal but continue to make them available electronically, that would be fine with me. And, and on all these questions, I'm showing you just the share that agree strongly with them, eight, nine, or 10 out of 10. Um, humanities, social sciences, and sciences, there, there is, al although there was a, a, a modest decline from 2009 to 2010, a, a, an overall st very strong and growing level of agreement with that, with that statement. Fine with me to cancel the print and just make it available electronically. Um, now, publication format, we asked faculty members I, to, to agree with the statement, I'm completely comfortable with journals I use regularly, ceasing their print versions and publishing in electronic only form. And academic library directors, almost, uh, an, identical, um, almost an identical question. Here are the faculty members. Humanities and social sciences and sciences from 2009 to 2012 are becoming more comfortably with, with, with becoming more comfortable. Um, and here are the library directors in the blue and red bars. Library directors are overwhelmingly uh, agree strongly that they would like to see uh, uh, see um, see that transition take place even more so than the aggregate of the faculty members. So among library directors. You know, you you all and your colleagues. There is a a a, a, um, a unanimity about this transition for journal current issues, and and you know reasonably high levels of support among faculty members, to a, a majority agreeing strongly with that. Now here is collections management of journals. Within the next five years, the use of online or digitized journals will be so prevalent among faculty members and students that it won't be necessary to maintain library collections of hard copy journals. And here. Um, these are the library directors, you know, more than 50% and at the doctoral institutions, more than 60% of library directors are agreeing strongly. It won't be necessary to have print journal collections in five years' time. And I, I think for, for many of you, this is actually already the reality or nearly the, or, you know, moving towards that reality. So, um, so that's, 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 that's what collections have looked like. Now, on back file format, um, assuming that electronic versions of journals are proven to work well, I would be happy, happy to see hard copy collections discarded, it, not be accession or withdrawn or you know, sent overseas, but discarded um, and replaced entirely by electronic collections. Now, of course, faculty members and library directors are going to react differently to this. Faculty members have no constraints, no trade-offs, right? I, who's happy to discard things? Library directors, you all are, are, are you know, managing in an environment of of real trade-offs and real um, cost-benefit calculations. Here are the faculty members. In 2009 and 2012, now humanities not so much, clearly not so much agreeing strongly with that statement for journals, okay? But you know, in the social sciences, sciences and sciences, 40 to 50% levels of agreement with that statement. Where they faced no, no need to agree with that, they gave it an eight, nine, or 10 out of 10. Um, now, that, that's, um, that's, that, that's the faculty members, again, on the right-hand side. Library directors, you know, extremely strong levels of agreement. You know, I would be happy to discard the print journals. And I think, and I think that, you know, again, words like happy and discarded suggest the strength of the commitment of library directors towards this, this you know, future, right? And, and I think is some of what is, um, is affecting how we think about how we think about books too, and not in a not in a bad way, but you know this is the reality of what we've all been collectively working on over the last ten or fifteen years, and you know what does that mean for for um, for books? So um, so let me um, let me now uh, 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 say a few words about uh, more than a few words about books. Um, I'll, I'll focus my remarks mostly on monographs, the um, the long form, typically book length, scholarly. Narratives typically written by an academic, published by university press for an audience of fellow scholars. You, you know what I'm talking about. They matter tremendously in the humanities and some social sciences and certainly less so in, in many other fields. But, um, but the monograph as I discuss it today, um, you know, I, I'm talking about it that way because a lot of the research that I've done is grounded in, in the monograph. But I, I suspect, I believe that 
um, uh, that mo much of my perspective here is going to apply um, to books more generally. So I'd, I want to kind of raise that as a question, but I, I, sus I suspect you'll you'll see um, see that uh, uh, see that um, that connection and the evidence uh, that I'm going to share does not clearly point to the same outcome for monographs as we've seen for journals. And I think that's the um, that's actually the that's sort of the thesis statement of of this talk. Um, so we, we all know electronic versions of scholarly monographs are now widely available. Um, they're available through library channels that we all know and have paid a lot of attention to, Project Muse and eBrary and, and so on and so forth. Um, they're also available through consumer channels like Kindle. And I want to emphasize that that point, because I think that is driving a tremendous amount of the confusing dynamics around, around books right now. They're not just available through library channels in the way that journals up until this point, and this is changing too, have principally been, the digital journals have principally been available through library channels. So anyway, now that digital versions are increasingly available, um, will, uh, you know, will libraries um, cease, cease collecting? Um, uh, wait, let me, let me say that again. Now that digital versions of, of books are increasingly available, will, will libraries cease collecting print? Will they undertake large-scale deaccessioning of print collections? Um, at many academic libraries, circulation of print materials has declined substantially over the past decade. Print book materials has declined substantially. Um, and looking at that evidence, I think libraries are making a number of different choices, actually, about, about what, to, what to do. Um, the, effect of, of, the effect of electronic book, um, uh, bo electronic books upon acquisitions and retention I don't think is actually yet settled in nearly the same way as it was for journals. Um, so let me let me show you a little bit of what we do know. Um, we know from academic library directors. Um, we asked them. This is this is just this fall. What percentage of your print book collection has your library deaccessioned because you have access to those books in electronic format? Um, and and here's here's what the share looked like. The red the red portion of that somewhat elongated pie slice um, is the folks who say 0%. I have withdrawn. I've discarded nothing at all. Um, the light blue, um, the, 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 all of the blue bars together, um, those are, are the folks who've discarded anything up to a lot, um, is about 60%. So that's, that's actually um, suggests that there is more activity already going on um, that, than, than perhaps I'm accounting for in some, in some ways. Um, if you look at the, but most of that is folks who've discarded one to ten percent of their collection. So forty, so forty percent zero, forty percent one to ten, plus or minus, and then another fifteen or twenty percent is has discarded more than ten percent of their print book collections because the books are available digitally, not because of any kind of regular reading or you know other kinds of collection management practices. That's what's that's what's happening. Um, um, already and and in, and in fact, there are some examples of libraries stepping back from print that many of you many of you will be familiar with. Um, some libraries are are, are establishing um, e preferred acquisition programs, and I, I'm hearing that even in in re, you know research libraries now. Um, um, others are uh, are initiating planning exercises for for sharing print collections of monographs to reduce resources expended. Um, and in some cases, librarians are pursuing these. Um, alternative directions because they don't believe multi-format redundancy to be a wise expenditure of limited resources. And we're looking back at journals and seeing a print to electronic transition, like from 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 zero, you know, from a hundred here to a hundred there as the model, and imagining that perhaps that will will or should come um, for books. S some people um, are thinking that. But in other cases, you know, we're feeling pressure by institutional, Leaders who've expressed uh, that disinclination to fund capital um, projects to ex ex um, to uh, to expand library spaces to accommodate collections growth, um, or in in many cases, and this is something that we saw very clearly in our library survey, because library directors are being called upon in at some libraries to reduce their support for research um, and focus their resources on supporting students. So there's a lot of different factors going on that are pulling us towards rethinking. Um, rethinking books, and I think I think that's why why our work here is so um, important yesterday and today. 
Um, many of these direct, so, so, so you know, at, at the same time, I think we, we all know, but it's probably worth re-emphasizing that, um, that many of these directions are, are probably not yet, yet the norm, and there's a lot of, of, of good reason for that. Um, research libraries um, um, co are continuing to are continuing to build print collections, even while they're have invested so tremendously in digital collections. Um, they continue to build print collections while they while they um, are expanding digital collections. But but I, I think it's worth reminding us that there are open questions about digital rights management issues for eBooks that could really impact this shift. Issues about interlibrary lending that um, that in, you know. Um, Whereas Joni Guinaguilla has been been thinking about seriously um, issues about um, downloading complete books versus downloading only sections of books and different kinds of licensing programs that are available through library channels that may or may not be nearly as easy as the way that we use journals um, policies on simultaneous users um, you know and and in general risks associated with foregoing local collections in favor of, of licensed resources in terms of issues from everything from pricing stability to preservation um, as we've seen with journals as well so um, so you know and, and so and so we're also seeing some research libraries you know even for journals expressing a commitment that they'll continue to build locally owned collections and in at least a few cases that they have no plans to deaccession even print journals in the medium term future. So there's a, a wide range of different thinking and behavior about these, about these questions out there. So as libraries grapple with a vision for their collections, they face, and, and this I think is important to say, along with publishers and distribution partners, um, a real period of, of what I think is uncertainty rather than, than something that's settled. Um, one big question for me is whether digital content platforms will develop the features and interfaces that actually provide a compelling alternative to the codex, um, or whether they will instead develop a rich role um, as a complement to the codex. And I think that that is something that matters tremendously in designing the system that we're all here thinking about. Um, so so I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to argue is that we need to think about print collections management and shared print in the context of the future of the book and the future of reading, um, and not just in the future of collections. I think that's a, a key, uh, key distinction. Um, I believe that this period of uncertainty will be resolved by an improved understanding of how reading and other usage behaviors are changing, and whether and how they'll continue to change in the future. And, um, and I have some data to share with you about that. Um, you may know several studies have examined preferences and behaviors associated with book formats in an academic context. Many of you are familiar with or indeed perhaps have participated in some of the Springer studies, for example, at University of California and Wes Wellesley Colleges. Um, you know, things like this, that this, this comes out of the, uh, the, the, Wellesley, um, the Wellesley survey. Um, you know, how do you feel about e-books? Um, e-books can be an acceptable option, say many faculty members and students. Um, I use e-books, but I prefer print books, say many um, faculty members and students. Um, l let me, um, let me uh, you know, and, and, and there's been some talk that students in particular may have a higher preference for print than, than faculty members do, and I, I don't have a lot of student data about this, but I think that's, that's an interesting um, thing to, uh, to think about. You know, recognizing this kind of, these, that these kinds of issues probably matter tremendously to us. Um, we've introduced a lot of questions related to scholarly monographs in our 2012 faculty survey and our 2013 survey of library directors, and, and that's what I'm going to take you through now. So, um, so here's here's frequency. Frequency actually matters tremendously, and this isn't this isn't frequency that's gained by you know analyzing usage statistics. This is an impression that faculty members have about their frequency of um, of, of using ebooks and and you'll you'll see this question is, is actually a little complicated. You may have had the opportunity to read scholarly monographs in electronic format, either through a library subscription database or through standalone ebooks. So we're indifferent to the channel in this question. Um, how often have you used scholarly monographs in digital form in the last six months? And they could choose often, occasionally, rarely, or or never. Um, and fully seventy percent of academics responding to the survey. Um, said that often or occasionally over the last six months they've used scholarly monographs in electronic format, um, which um, I would characterize as a lot higher than I had expected 
going into that um, survey. That's a year and almost a year and a half ago now, so um, I'm not. I don't know what, what we should expect today. Um, And let's see, now I want to talk about importance for a minute or two. Um, among faculty members, we asked them to respond to the notion that electronic versions of scholarly monographs play an important role in my re research and teaching. Not just that I have used them in the last six months, but they're important to me. And again, this is eight, nine, or 10 out of 10, very strong levels of agreement. And a slightly different formulation for the library directors, electronic versions play an important role in the research and teaching of faculty members at my institution. Okay, so one is personal, one is institutional, and I, I don't want us to confuse that. Um, now, among the faculty members, that's the green bar, fully 50% agree strongly, eight, nine, or 10 out of 10, that, that, um, that they're important to their research and teaching. But the share of library directors is much lower, and you've, some, if, so, so, those of you who've heard me um, over the last week or two as we've been releasing the library survey, please forgive me, but I think, that, I th I think it's worth dwelling on what this means. Okay, this, this means that faculty members uh, more than a year ago were more likely to think that ebooks were important to their research and teaching than library directors are today. So this is some more evidence that maybe there's actually something, uh, uh, a sort of a trend line going on here or some kind of um, uh, you know, importance here that we should try to understand. I, I think the source of this misalignment, this is just my speculation really, I think the source of this misalignment is the very strong importance of non-library channels for books, for, for e-books. I think that um, when, when we talk to um, I, when we talk to historians, they can't they, they can't stop themselves uh, talking about the importance of Google Books for them. Um, and and you know even even though though libraries created Google Books in a very real sense, that's no longer a library channel. Um, in the sense of, of the, the way that um, uh, the way that that uh, discovery flows work, um, and you know things like Kindle are really important consumer channels for for some anyway, and so so that could be a really important source of that misalignment and one that we might wish to grapple with a little bit a little bit further. Um, the the other the other uh, the other thing though that that I, I want to um, uh, talk about is that cover to cover reading, while it's not to be dismissed. It's by no means the only way of using a monograph, and I think that I think that you know we we know this. Some readers um, skim the introduction and the conclusion to determine whether to read more fully. Others use built-in discovery tools to navigate the text. You know the table of contents or the index, things like that. And in many cases, engage deeply with only a very small portion of the overall the overall monograph. Um, perhaps at the chapter level or, or even at a, at a subchapter level. Art historians flip through the books and use the images in the books as a, as a guide to navigating the author's argument. Faculty members assign students just a selection from a book um, to read on reserve or um, in a course pack. So, um, so, this, this, th so for, for me, the question of, of, of how to, um, of, of, uh, um, of, of, of when one uses a digital book and when one uses a print book is actually really important. And th this set of use cases is one that we've, th is a set that we've developed um, to try to understand, to tease apart when faculty members prefer print and when they prefer digital. And um, this, this is again a year and a half, almost a year and a half old, but um, it, it, it basically says, you know, here, here's a list of ways you could use a scholarly monograph. Think about each of these things. Um, and indicate how much easier or harder it would be to do them in print versus digital format. Um, and you'll see two at the top that are about reading um, and two at the bottom that are about exploratory and searching behaviors. And the differences couldn't be more stark. Um, so so the, the, for, for reading, whether it's cover to cover or even just a section, um, faculty members tell us that that is much or at least somewhat easier to, to do in print format than in digitally. There is a decisive preference for print for reading purposes. Um, um, and for those exploratory and search-driven behaviors, there is a decisive preference for digital. Um, and then there's some behaviors in, in the middle that are a little bit um, less, less clearly preferenced. Um, so, you know, this is, um, uh, uh, just trying to get, get caught up with my notes here. Um, so, so, um, so for the most part, faculty members are comfortable making a choice based on their sense of which format will best suit the particular activities that they are, um, are performing. And this, um, 
Uh, and while we don't have trend line data to see if this is changing, and it could be changing, and it could be that that we're all six of these use cases are steadily moving towards the digital. I don't I don't know, um, but um, but the single point in time data from from 2012 indicate that many respondents perceive a dual format environment, and I think that we um, the dual a dual format environment again is not what we've seen for for journals other than for a very brief transitional moment in time. Um, so, um, and, and, and I think the other thing that this, that this uh, draws out perhaps even more strongly is that the key barrier to transitioning to a digital only environment, at least for scholarly monographs and maybe for books more generally, is providing for in-depth reading via electronic versions. Um, and that's the, there's a, that is an issue that I, I think is really important for our community to grapple with. Um, whether this has to do with limitations in annotations or note-taking options or the inability to compare multiple monographs in the way that some scholars tell us is so important um, or the eye strain associated with, with different types of reading interfaces, I don't think we know. Um, but, but at this point, the codex remains faculty members' preferred mechanism for in-depth reading of scholarly works and that's why the problems that we're confronting today are so challenging. Um, so in the interest of time, I want to I want to um, summarize one or just one or two things quickly. Um, I want to say that that there is a um, let me we're done with that slide. So um, uh, so so let so let me say that um, that in terms of discovery, um, th th there are a lot of really interesting things to say about the discovery of scholarly monographs and the way that 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 is and is not uh, happening through um, uh, through library provided channels. Um, there is a, a, a transition taking place in the way that discovery is happening that I think is, 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 um, is, is relevant and if in fact I'm right about the importance of consumer channels is one that, that navigates around the library or disintermediates the library rather than, rather than positioning the library as any kind of, of gateway um, or discovery starting point for, uh, for, um, for books. Um, and. And I think the other thing that um, may be worth saying is that is that this form of the book I think remains a, a little bit um, unsettled as we transition or if we transition to a print to electronic format. I mean the, the advent of mass digitization programs over the past decade or so and their focus on large scale scanning production, the Google Books and, and so forth, scanning efforts have really quieted our consideration of the impacts of the digital format on the monograph as a form. I think we should remember there were some really rich and interesting conversations 10 or 15 or 20 years ago about what the future of the monograph would, would be from a form perspective. Um, and, and I think there are, there are questions that we actually may wish to re-examine about, about how books are changing and whether they are the static objects that going forward will even will will even think about in the same in the same um, in the same way, but that that may be something that we can we can see if there's interest in talking further about. So um, so I think what I what I want to say by way of conclusion is that monographs are complex tools for communicating scholarship. They they are much more complex um, than the journal article. I think I think books generally are in some ways more complex than the journal article. Um, scholars are approaching them in different ways depending on what they're trying to accomplish. Digital versions of monographs have, um, have made some of these ways of using books much more efficient, but in other ways they can't compete with the codex. And, um, and now I'd like to speculate a little bit about what that might mean for us uh, here today. Um, I see two basic approaches that the collections management and shared print communities might wish to consider. Um, I think the one that we've mostly been talking about is about building sharing networks for print books that are more robust than, than ever before imagined. Um, and there are reasons why that might be a good, a good thing to put our, our energies into, to allow book collections to be managed down, but albeit perhaps without the same space reducing impacts um, or the same kinds of user satisfaction levels that we've seen to date for journals. So, you know, we, we're talking about the, um, uh, you know, s speed, speed is important, speed leads to happiness. I, I get that. I think those are really important principles. 
but immediate, Im, you know, if that is sacrificing immediacy for less speed, that's different than if we're increasing speed. So I think I think we have to remember that that there's that depending on our users, there are two different potential things going going on here. And um, so that's anyway, that's one that's one direction. Um, building incredibly richer and um, uh, and more robust sharing networks than ever before imagined. But I think alternatively, we might identify long form reading in digital form as a key challenge that are that is facing our efforts here to think differently about book collections. Um, uh, the key challenge for both readers and for collections alike. In this kind of scenario, we might want to study systematically the very serious problems that seem to be facing academics in long form reading of print books. Um, especially, and this I think is something that we need to confront as a community, especially through library provided channels. So we have not succeeded in, cre in creating or acquiring anything with the simplicity of the consumer channels. Um, and that's, that's a challenge for the library as much as it is for our readers and our collections. Um, in, in that scenario, we would work to develop solutions with whether it's ebook plat platforms and channels, or, um, or we might determine that those challenges are intractable and that the codex will remain the best way to do long form reading of, of narrative and I, uh, for faculty members. And I don't, I don't mean to suggest that it is or will be, but that, that, um, that that's, should be on the table. Um, so if those, if long form readings, if long form reading of, um, of ebooks um, and some of the associated challenges are in fact intractable, then we will need to manage a true dual format environment, at least for scholarly books indefinitely. And then maybe some of these sharing networks, um, you know, ro very, very robust sharing networks will, will actually be even more important for a longer time than they have proved to be for journals. But if on the other hand, and this is actually what I believe, but this is just a personal belief, if on the other hand, um, these challenges are transitional and the um, ability to read books um, is one that faculty members and students alike will embrace digitally, um, then we have a slightly different kind of problem. Resource expenditures to optimize print collections infrastructure for delivery would in that case perhaps not be the best use of time and, 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 and resources. Rather, our primary concern in that case, if, if these concerns are transitional, um, our, our primary concern would be with how best to serve user needs in an emerging digital book environment um, where library provided channels may be running a distant second to the consumer marketplace. Thank you. I suspect s some will want to take issue with any number of things that I've just said, um, and I, I look forward to the discussion. So we started this conversation a bit before your keynote, and um, I've been thinking about this for a, a while, is why scholars, graduate students and faculty, or uh, even the general public, why they love books. There's an emotional fetishistic, I mean, we all know that scholars are fetishists about books. Um, and in this instance, it, and I'm trying to figure out why. Why do we talk about loving books, the physical book, and not an article? Nobody loves an article. And one of the things that I've been, talk <laughs> uh, been thinking about is, in this case, I think time equals love. You spend much more time mm -hmm. with a, a monograph. But I also think for physical codex, your hands are implicated. So as ebooks move to devices, some of that emotional attachment might migrate to the device. But the problem for libraries, it seems to me, is that physical, the codex is a detachable token of love. You know, people love libraries as place, but they also love books. And when you get a physical item, it's a detachable token that carries with it your emotional attachment to the place almost. But as the device, it, it made me think, when you were talking about channels, even if love or emotional attachment and thus support migrates to the device, to an iPad or a Kindle or even a phone, the channel is no longer connected at all to the library. And we've seen that with journal articles, is they don't know where it's coming from. You know, it's not, whereas for us as a consortium, the Ohio Link brand is physically carried on a print, our label is on the print. So I guess the, in that 
I, I completely agree that that practice of reading, whether or not we're in a tr transitional moment, has real implications for the place of the library in scholars' hearts, which has implications for political and, you know, political, financial, et cetera. So, so how do we get at knowing how to measure that in a way that will guide, uh, you know, decision making in the future? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I, you know, I think I think there's two or three things that might be worth saying um, in that space. One is that, one is that the, um, you know, the the a piece of the Kindle experience for me is reading a book on my phone on the subway. I mean, that's for, for me is where a lot of my, and how a lot of my reading happens now. Um, and you know, I don't. I'm um, curious whether we have uh, we have platforms for ebook delivery in library channels, but we don't in, in in the library marketplace. But we don't have, I think, the same strength of, of channels to move things onto our devices. And I think that's that's not to your question, but I think it's an important an important piece of it. Um, I, you know, I, I would love to see some more really rich qualitative or almost anthropological ethnographic work done about the way that, that reading is actually happening. One of the limitations of the data that, that I was sharing is that it's, it's self-reported perceptions. And I think we know that, that um, sometimes we can trust those and sometimes we have to be a little more dubious about them. So I think it would be really interesting to see um, whether it's academics or students, just exactly how they're doing reading for academic and scholarly purposes, and I, I and and what that what that means for some of those, um, you know, whether it's emotional attachments or um, you know or si or simply behaviors, where you know in 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 some way um, you know we might if if we have a set of emotional attachments but a different set of behaviors, which is a hypothesis then we would manage that in a very different way than if the behaviors and the emotions were reinforcing of one another. So I think that's, I think those are, those are some issues that we um, could explore anthropologically if there were, if there were interest in doing that. Hi, I'm Joni Blake with the Greater Western Library Alliance and I had a question for Roger. Um, you talked about the, the robust sharing for, for monographs, primarily through interlibrary loan as an example, is something that we have worked very hard in, in uh, libraries and through consortia to establish. And one of the things that Gwila is working on is a package of software that would allow for the interlibrary loan of e-books and um, trying to parlay that strong um, resource sharing network into uh, an ebook environment. And what we are finding is that the discovery piece of scholarly monographs in an electronic format is, is a huge problem because many libraries, um, they catalog these, their ebook collections at the local OPAC or discovery layer level and they don't do it at the central WorldCat layer. So we are making things hard for people to find presumably because we thought we couldn't interlibrary loan them, but it turns out we're gonna try really hard to do that. Um, and so what does, and, and so that's, that's sort of the scenario that, that we are finding through this project, but within the, the greater context of the discussions of this symposium, what does this do um, to us when we are looking at these broad collection analysis projects where we are lopping off a huge chunk of our own content that's not being analyzed as part of this process. Um, and, and so when we, as we are bridging the print to electronic divide with one foot on either side of the bridge, we can't get a really good picture of, of the full scope of our, of our collections if the electronic stuff isn't, isn't there. And so is going back and doing a great big cataloging project the way to fix this or, or what's the, how do we go from here to, to do all of these, fix all of these interknitted problems that we see? Well, that's a, I, think, I think you may have more answers on that than I do, actually, Joni. But um, I mean, I, I think what we're, what we're clearly um, at risk of doing is, um, is, is 
imagining the same kind of, you know, in the, in the absence of data about our collections, about the usage of, of different formats, I think we're at risk of making decisions that, that were, I believe, correct for journals um, with, without the same level of confidence that even if it wasn't driven by data, turned out in retrospect to be right for journals. And it, that's a great example of the kind of data that, um, that probably are, are absent, and the reading behaviors data is another, another piece of it. So yeah, I, um, I, don't, I don't know technically how we're gonna go about solving that, but um, maybe others, others would, I mean, I think it's an interesting discussion. Maybe others would like to speak to that as well. Uh, Gary Frost, Iowa. We're all in accord over the key premise of transition. And uh, we're all captivated by trend lines in terms of various formats. How would you approach uh, the diagnostic of trend lines that would indicate the fulfillment of the dual format complementary interaction of paper and screen? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure I, I, I want to try to answer that, but I'm not sure I have the question perfectly right. Um, I, it seems to me that what we know today is that we are in a dual format for monographs. Um, I, I, I think the data that I showed are maybe not convincing, but pretty strong on, on that and do suggest that kind of complementarity which doesn't exist for, for journals in quite the same way. Um, one thing that, that I hope we'll do is see if there are trend lines there in terms of whether um, reading behaviors move increasingly towards, uh, towards digital <laughs> formats. Um, and I think there are a number of ways to get at that, both attitudinally as we've done, as we've done in this uh, survey project, but also ethnographically or, or anthropologically. Yeah, I wasn't referring specifically to binary trends, mm -hmm. but my key word would be the fulfillment trend, which we do not yet see, of the interaction of the two formats in scholarly monographs. Wait, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't think I understand what you mean with the term fulfillment it's trend. It's a third thing. It's a the uh, mediation of the two as a sustainable, even a resilient methodology of book trans uh, transmission over time. Mm -hmm. In other words, how would we see those? This is this is an esoteric deal. Uh, how would we see that in a trend that we're actually fulfilling, almost inadvertently and without realizing it, the eerie. Um, complementary nature of formats? Well, I think it's an open question whether they are complementary or not, and I think that's the, mm, that's the, I think yeah, that's thanks. the research question. Um, I think that we've seen um, pretty, I think we seek certain forms of complementarity for journals too, right? Um, I think there, there is a, um, uh, you know, a, a small number of copies that I think we, we all agree need to be retained system-wide in order to support the digital transition for the use of scholarly journals. And I think we've seen rationales for that, like preservation, um, like you know, redigitization, um, like authentic, you know, ensuring authenticity. Um, so I think there are rationales for that sort of complementarity. I think the question that we are faced with today is whether there is reading complementarity, whether for books, whether reading is, is still a, an important value of the codex, and our evidence suggests that for faculty members it is. And I think the, um, you know, I don't see it as especially eerie or, um, or um, uh, I mean, I, I think it's just a data-driven question about how behaviors or if behaviors will, will change or not change. So um, I don't, I, I think that we have a possibility of a digital-only future that with the asterisk that by digital only, I mean digital only in the same sense that we mean for journals. Um, but I also think we see the possibility um, of, a, of a dual format environment, and perhaps that's what you mean by, by that complementarity. I think the question is whether that is transitional 
um, or, or lasting. Um, my own suspicion is that it's transitional, but I don't think that's an evidence-driven um, statement. I think that's just a suspicion. So. Uh, Brian Gray, Case Western. Uh, you talked about the variations between journals and books that's leading the, the conversation the two days here. And I've had some pretty heated discussions with faculty. I start off as collection manager in engineering. And, and they will regularly say engineering faculty and students do not read books. And they, they will repeat this over and over. Yet our data shows our School of Engineering is the highest borrowing school in our library. They're the highest in interlibrary loan. And I think it really points to your slide where you show the differences in usage. Um, have you looked at your faculty data and broken it down into disciplines or other variations to see um, how the different pockets respond to those questions? We, we have, yeah, that's a, gr that's a very good um, uh, topic for us to talk about, is that to some degree for journals, but especially for books and monographs, there are enormous disciplinary differences in practices and, and indeed in attitudes. And, you know, I think, um, uh, I'm a little surprised about your data about engineering myself, um, based on some of the data that I've seen. But, um, but you know, I think I think that I guess what what I would what I would be asking that faculty member in that case is what what they mean by reading, because, you know, of course, there's a lot of research and citation and and on, and some of those kinds of use cases that take place in all disciplines. The kind of cover to cover reading of a book is actually exceedingly co uh, uncommon, even in the humanities. Right. I mean, I think that. I think that the, that's one of the things that I don't have data about that I think is important to say is that there's a lot more of the, the digital preferred activities of those six activities, the digital preferred activities happen way, way, way more commonly, frequently than long form reading of a scholarly monograph. I mean, even the most voracious readers among us are reading only perhaps a few hundred books a year, but, not, but, but are searching probably thousands and thousands of times a year. So, you know, I think there's some frequency issues there that are interesting as well. But, um, but that said, there are, are huge disciplinary differences here. And, um, and in, our, in our faculty survey in the data set, we, we have breakdowns at, at a disciplinary level that are, are really alarming. So, and, I, and I think the, um, you know, I think the, um, the, the hum humanists value the monograph more than other, other fields do. Um, but they're also a little bit less likely to be at the forefront of that digital transition than some of the other fields are. So I think that's uh, just a few observations about, about this data set. Constance Malthus, OCLC Research. Uh, Roger, I was very interested in, uh, in this challenge you've um, presented us with of uh, a decision to be made within uh, within the library community, within the collections management community, of, of investments to be made in implementing, executing on uh, building shared print collections um, in contrast to the effort investments we might make individually, institutionally, or collectively in pressing ebook platforms, providers, uh, to really push on developing affordances for long form reading. Right where we've seen there's clearly a, a, a deficiency there, um, and I wonder, um, I wonder how you imagine either individual institutions or consortial entities taking on that second challenge. Is that a point of negotiation at the point of, of licensing to say, well, we, we're simply not interested in in licensing your engineering ebooks unless they support long form reading, Wh whatever disciplinary segment, let's say, that for which we feel that we, we simply can't accelerate this transition unless ebooks support um, a different kind of, uh, set of set of reading practices. I mean, really just operationally, where do you think that, at what, where does that conversation happen? Well, and, and, I, and I think, and I think the, um, just, just to launch into that, I think one of the one of the most insightful observations that I've heard about the print to electronic transition for journals was, I believe it was Clifford Lynch who said that it's not really a print to electronic transition, it's really a print to, um, uh, 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 it was a, a basically a print to um, on-demand printing mm -hmm. transition, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and so, you know, there, there were many years when, what, and, and I think this has become less so in the era of the iPad, but there were many years when what it meant to have an electronic journal was that you 
printed out the article on your on your desktop. And so, so I think the um, I think that the um, you know the question of what 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 the library community can do to influence that and change that is is a really um, d a difficult uh, a, a difficult challenge. I think that we haven't really um, organized around the questions of what. I think some some have, and I think Gwil is a good is is one good example of trying to organize around, um, you know, a different a different vision of how we want the ebooks ebooks to operate or how we want these digital products to operate. Um, but I think we we tend to um, find ourselves in a um, in a um, in an acquisitions mindset of do I buy it or not, rather than in a kind of co development space where we can. Um, work to uh, to either build as a community or build with vendors a set of tools and products that are are are, are um, more well suited. And you know, I mean, I think I think there this is this is an area that um, that we're seeing a little bit of progress on in terms of discovery, where I think there's a little bit more of a vision of what libraries want from discovery. And in acquisitions processes, there has been a little bit more of a of a dialogue about, you know, this is nice for now, but what I really want is something that looks a little more like that. Um, and I, 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 wonder, I wonder if we're organized or um, structured to have those kinds of conversations on, on collections acquisitions as well, where we're actually acquiring platforms and uh, tools more s at, to, as much or more so than we're acquiring content. And that's a shift that I don't think we've really grappled with as much as we could. I wonder if I could ask you to, to, to extend your thinking there a little bit um, with respect to differences between what can be achieved uh, with the retrospective digitized content uh, versus negotiation with prospective production of ebooks that would support a broader range of, of reading behavior. So just thinking, um, you alluded to, to the um, use of, of Google Books by historians in, in particular. Um, we know that much of the content in Google Books is, uh, is also present in Hathi Trust. There we have um, a large repository of material, library-driven values, potentially, I don't mean at all to speak um, uh, on behalf of Hathi Trust, but potentially some interests in having a sandbox for developing new reading environments that are more supportive of, of Consuming, you know, long form publications, cover to cover, long sections, what have you. Um, that's something we can do with the retrospectively digitized material around which groups like Cotty Trust have, have exercised some control, um, or at least given us some opportunity. Uh, is there um, is there an advantage to working on that retrospective piece? Uh, without necessarily knowing what we can do prospectively, thinking particularly if we're talking about scholarly monographs, what is the interest on the part of the scholarly publishing community to um, to accelerate toward more of an e or a print on demand future? In in their community, there presumably are greater interests in prolonging the dual format period because you can meet some of the needs electronically, and then you can also continue to sell into. A traditional print consumption models. So I just wonder if you. Yeah, I mean, I guess I've been I've been more grounded in thinking about monographs. So you know that that steers you towards a slightly different set of, of providers than perhaps Hadi. I mean, not that Hadi Trust doesn't have lots of monographs in it, but you know, steers you in a slightly different direction. But um, I I think the you know look the fact that there is a library community owned channel, um, and you know thinking about what that what that might imply and mean is a really um, significant question. Um, I, I, I just off the top of my head would, would wonder about, you know, um, whether, uh, you know, what, what it means to have page scans rather than um, manipulable uh, text as the, as, the delivery, um, as the delivery layer um, and what limitations that might suggest in terms of innovating reading, you know, digital reading platforms, but I, I, don't, I don't feel um, like I have a lot of information about that. Um, I also think that we, um, I, I think that, I think the I mean, Constance, I think the, um, that it would be great to see some kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of further developments there. And I think Hadi's really been working on its, you know, reading interfaces. And so maybe, maybe that is a good, a good place to, uh, to start.
Barbara Strauss from Cleveland State University. <clears throat> there, amongst the mo uh, scholarly monographs, there seems to be that gray area where recent research is in, you name it. But the vendors and the publishers treat them like articles in journals. You can get them, you can search them separately, you can read one chapter as an article which is different than the next chapter. And it's not just those monographic series that say recent researches, but there is a, a glut of these books that kind of behave like a, like a journal. I, maybe we've got two models in scholarly journals, or scholarly monographs. The thing that mocks the journal and the thing that is monographic. That's a good, yeah, they're, they're, and, and I, think, I think it's easy to, you know, it's, it's too easy to categorize things as books or journals or, you know, monographs, and you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is masking a lot, of, a, a lot of, um, of, of different, you know, individual types of formats and, and behaviors, so I totally agree with you. So maybe we've run out of time or run over time, actually, looking at, the, looking at my watch. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>